Welcome everyone to yet another session by Climate Governance Malaysia. And this is a topic that's very close to our hearts. How are we going to be able to make informed decisions about climate risks? We're so pleased that this is in collaboration with the Institutional Investors Council, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Juan Rohaya to give us a welcome address. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Datin. So, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, a, warm, a warm welcome to all participants at the second series of our webinar organized by in collaboration with Climate Governance Malaysia, which is uh, entitled Making Informed Decisions About Climate Risk. Before I proceed further, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the two distinguished guests from SMP Global, Michael Salvertico and Sana Joseph, for joining us today, uh, sharing their invaluable insights and experience. Our appreciation also to our partner for today's webinar, Climate Governance Malaysia, in particular, Datin Sri Sunita, for joining hands with us in organizing this event, touching on a very important agenda in sustainability, i.e. climate change, and how institutional investors should assess climate risk in making their investment decisions. As we are all aware, today's webinar is intended to raise awareness about the fiduciary duty of institutional investors in their quest to address physical climate risks, which may pose material financial risks that can be both critical business challenge or opportunity. This is timely ahead of the most anticipated 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the parties, or in short, COP. COP26 scheduled for November this year. The COP26 is regarded as an important summit that will bring parties together to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and expected to witness stronger commitment and action plans from countries to reduce emission in keeping the goal temperature to rise limit to 1.5 degree. As all of us are living in a critical times with the capital market researched by issues ranging from unbated COVID-19 pandemic to economic downturn to labor rights and political instability, it has now become crucial for institutional investors to rally for a formidable, sustainable development agenda. Doubtlessly, it's imperative for institutional investors to play an effective stewardship role in shaping, influencing, and championing the sustainability cause in the realms of the Malaysian capital market. Given the, given the overwhelming range of issues under the ESG umbrella, it is common for companies to face the challenge of prioritizing prioritization, especially when resources are limited. While companies prefer to tackle those issues that can lead to some quick wins and within their resources, Institutional investors prefer that companies focus on those issues that are material and pose significant threat to them across their business operation. Like it or not, climate change has emerged as an increasingly salient issue universally. Many firms are increasingly facing risks related to climate change, from natural disasters or regulation to combat a global rise in temperature. A recent report from the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has concluded that it is that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Once again, rare and unprecedented weather extremes are becoming more common, and this trend will continue even if the world limits global warming to 1.5 degrees. Investors are inevitably exposed to climate change through their portfolio, that they manage and invest in. This includes, among others, risk of stranded assets, resulting from a transition to a low carbon economy, which, which will pose negative impact to the investment. Under such circumstances, high quality information on firms uh, exposure on climate risk has therefore become very vital for investors to make informed investment decisions. It is crucial for investors to look into management of their investments and portfolio exposed to environment and climate risk related risks to minimize asset stranding. 
Nevertheless, climate risk disclosure is currently insufficient, thus requiring a concerted effort among investors, regulators, government and companies to improve reporting and transparency, not to mention profound mitigation efforts to address climate risk. In this regard, the Institutional Investor Council Malaysia IIC would always look forward to join hands with the relevant stakeholders to discover ways as to how governments and the private sector could have done differently. And we had known about specific areas of vulnerability to the physical, transitional and liability risk posed by climate change. More importantly, it is, in, it is the initiative to explore how the public private sectors are able to allocate finite and scarce, scarce resources to limit future exposure to risk or to reduce vulnerability of assets and infrastructure to loss and damage. In essence, we are calling on all companies, board and management to start focusing on managing climate risk and tap the ensuring opportunities which would benefit mankind dearly. With this note, I wish all the participants a fruitful and productive webinar and thank you for all your support. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you. And thank you to the Institutional Investors Council for supporting Climate Governance Malaysia once again. So let's go on and invite our two presenters from SP Global, which is Michael Salvatico, and to be followed by Sanya Joseph. Michael, of course, leads the ESG business development practice in Asia Pacific, while Sanya is a quantitative specialist at SP Global Market Intelligence. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, lovely introduction. I'm just going to take a minute to share my screen so that we can all see the presentation. Can you confirm that you can see the presentation? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Juan, for that introduction too. Uh, it, it's highly relevant to the world of finance today. The, the facts that you mention are a reality uh, and it's something that is uh, being addressed by the financial institutions across the world. And today's topic, um, when we look at making informed decisions about climate risks, we'll take into account some of the factors that you mentioned uh, and some of the, uh, with a focus on climate and scenario analysis. Uh, I've been working in this area with financial institutions for more than a decade, um, providing these solutions to investors and banks, and regulators, governments and corporates. And it's, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to see the focus uh, on these areas, these risks increase to represent the risks that they do face uh, in the bottom lines of companies. Uh, in this presentation, I'll cover the, the ESG factors across uh, climate change scenarios. Uh, we'll have a look at the, uh, the topics in the contents on the next page, but there are three things that I want you to, to take away from this presentation as well. And that is the focus on standardization of metrics uh, to measure ESG. And we're going to be looking at scenario analysis, the need for greater transparency, and that's across the reporting from corporates and financial institutions, and the global focus on climate change resilience and net zero. In today's uh, topic, I, I heard, um, you know, this is your second event, but, but I heard that we need to go deep. We need to go deeper than just an introduction. So we're going to be looking at some, some detail on the scenario analysis, the focus on, on what it is, how to measure portfolio exposure to climate change related risks and transition and physical risks. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to measure a portfolio's alignment to 1.5 degrees, which is the, the Paris alignment from the, the IPCC, and a deep dive on carbon footprinting and physical risks of portfolios. And, and there is a call to action after this. You know, the expectation is that you, you as investors uh, who are managing portfolios and climate change risk exposure can measure transition and physical risk in your, in your portfolios, and that you have some uh, aspects of how it's being managed through benchmarking, reporting, engagement, analysis and modelling, and as well uh, the shift to climate resilient indices. 
But before we get there, a quick view on S&P Global's role in this space. And, and S&P Global has been involved in financial markets for more than 100 years. But one area uh, that's become a focus is the ESG uh, and ESG indices and data and analytics and ratings. And S&P Global is in a really good position to provide these insights, um, having acquired the, the leading providers of environmental, social and governance uh, solutions uh, to optimise long term stakeholder value. Uh, S&P Global has over 100 years history, as I say, and, and, and that really comes through in two of the best known names in the ESG space. The acquisition of TrueCost five years ago with 20 years history in climate change resilience and the ESG scores from Ubico Sam. You see on this slide that we continue to, to strive to be the standard and we're recognised in our ESG investing from Asia Asset Management, Environmental Finance, and it's recognised, uh, our leadership is recognised in market activity as well. You can see that our ESG ETFs increased in asset under management by over 400% from Q1 last year to Q1 this year. There's been a shift in, in the focus of investors. And S&P Global uh, takes this, uh, in, the data used in the indices and provides it uh, as tools for our clients. Before we jump into all the detail on that scenario analysis, um, like Puan mentioned at the beginning of the introduction, it is important to remember why we're here. And for me, why we're here is represented um, by the angry fish, which you see in front of you. Uh, there's a quote that comes from the World Economic Forum, which says, today, business as usual is making the planet unlivable. Climate change is not a scenario and no level of global warming is good. These are facts. They're brought to light by the IPCC. For me, this this picture sums it up. Uh, it, it was a, a painting that my daughter and I bought recently as a reminder of mankind's impact on the oceans and the planets. It's called the angry fish and it sits on a, a meter square of uh, canvas and it looks angry. It's angry because it's painted on plastic rubbish, rubbish that the artist has collected from beaches around the world. He incorporates that rubbish into his art. Now think about it this way. The World Economic Forum forecasts the oceans will have more plastic waste than fish by 2050. This is a result of human waste. The health of the oceans is intimately tied to our health, humankind. Over 3 billion people depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods and coastal waters are deteriorating due to pollution and eutrophication. We know that 2.2 billion people lack safely managed drinking water and 4.2 billion people lack safely managed sanitation. These are just a few facts about SDG 6 clean water and sanitation and SDG 14 life below water. Companies play a major role in transitioning the global economy and in trans that transition to become more sustainable, equitable and SDG aligned. It benefits everyone's future. In this painting, the artist is doing his part to change the world. I ask myself, what am I doing? Do you ask yourself? Let's start thinking about transition risk with a, an overview. The overview of transition risk here is made up of four areas of thinking. Transition risk is naturally forward looking because we're going to assess the scenarios in the future. And because of that, there's some inherent uncertainty. And, and in that, it's bringing into account the, the science. It's the marriage of science and finance. And the IPCC has captured that link. We know that there's a number to aim for, reduction in emissions by 2050. That's very useful for finance people because we know there's a target and we can measure the emissions from companies today. So we know what we need to do. We know the trajectories of companies through initiatives like science-based targets. We can measure the financial impact. We can measure the financial impact of carbon pricing on emissions. And importantly, once we have this information, is how it informs our strategies to better inform our decisions, to become part of our strategic direction. If you think about 
scenario analysis in terms of climate change risk, there are four components, the four components that you see in front of you. Those components start with a baseline assessment of a carbon footprint. What's a focus on outputs? Then the assessment of Paris alignment, how aligned are the companies in your investments to the scenario of a two degree or a 1.5 degree world. And that can be measured. And that's a focus on the outcomes. The transition risk, if we fail to achieve alignment of all companies and the likely response of policy to add a carbon price, either domestically or internationally, which would affect exports potentially through trade tariffs, is a measure of the carbon price cost, the transition risk with a focus on financials. And finally, the physical risk impacts. A large number of the physical risk impacts are already built in to the current level of global warming of greater than one degrees. We can measure that focus on assets. How sensitive is the portfolio to acute and chronic risks? Let's dig deeper. Let's start with transition risk because transition risk is something that we can affect through our portfolios and our investments. We can affect the transition of companies. We can assess the carbon intensity of individual companies and aggregate that up to a portfolio level. Here you see that for many companies, the largest carbon pricing risk relates to the greenhouse gases. On the left hand side of this, uh, of, the, of the two charts, you can see the effective carbon price under a future scenario. This is an average carbon price. You can see a Paris aligned carbon price to the NDCs is well below the carbon price that's required to achieve a two degree aligned scenario with many scenarios in between. And on the right hand side, you can see the IEA based decarbonisation pathways, the trajectories. These trajectories are uh, assessments of pathways for different sectors using a sectorial decarbonisation approach. Cement, aluminium, steel, air transport and power generation. Let's have a look a bit more closely at the carbon price. How do you determine what the carbon price shock is to your portfolio? If we do end up in a situation where a carbon price is applied, in addition to the carbon prices that are applied today, what does that look like in terms of the earnings to the companies that you invest in? What are the earnings at risk to a carbon price? This can be assessed through a very detailed review of where a company's operations are, because understanding where a company's operations are is important to understanding what the current carbon price they're paying is today, but also what the future carbon price will be. The future carbon price is determined by standards such as the IEA, OECD and IRENA. They've been assessing the carbon price impacts across different locations around the world in order to achieve a two degree outcome. The carbon prices vary depending on where you are in the world. So there are two factors that are, are moving there. At the bottom of this chart on in the light blue of the bar graph, you see the current carbon price. That's the carbon price that the company, company is currently paying in the location where it is today. And that could be different across any location. We can aggregate that up at the company level. If we take the future carbon price, in this case, it's $120. It's an average global carbon price, but like I say, it varies depending on where a company's operations are. We can aggregate that up and we can calculate that risk premium, the unpriced carbon cost that sits in the middle. We can do that for a company, we can aggregate that for a portfolio. That gives you your assessment of a carbon price shock. What does that look like when it's aggregated at a portfolio level? Here are four different charts and tables that show you. On the left hand side, you can see the total apportioned unpriced carbon cost for two portfolios, for a portfolio on a benchmark, given a low, medium and high carbon price in four different time points, 2020 through to 2050. The table shows the different metrics for unapportioned unpriced carbon cost through to the weight, weight of, of negative margins. And you can see it at a sector level and a country level. 
let's have a look now at the assessment of Paris alignment. Another way of assessing transition risk. A way of assessing a company's alignment, its policies and procedures and strategies and targets, its history of emissions and trajectory of emissions, which lead to its forecast emissions. The best way to, to think about what, what this looks like is to visualize it. And the bottom chart with the lines across the time periods from 2012 out to 2025 is a way to represent that. We're using science-based targets approaches of SDA and GEVA. In, in the way to think about it, science exposed climate change. It's science that should be the method that's used to determine the trajectories of companies and the targets that they set. S&P Global has set a science-based target with SBT and has set that target to be achieved by suppliers as well. And that's a, a good point to think about as, as we look at the Paris alignment. It's not just about a carbon price in your location, it's carbon price in other locations where you trade. It's not just about the targets that you're setting in your organization, but the organizations that you are supplying to, because that supply chain pressure and focus is also a growing uh, issue amongst the companies that we're working with. They need their suppliers to meet carbon targets so that they meet their carbon targets. If we dig in a little bit deeper on the Paris alignment and have a look at the two different ways to assess the, the uh, trajectories of companies. Already we know that more than 500 companies have submitted a science-based target like, uh, like we have at S&P Global. The two methods to think about are SDA and GEVA. Um, let's have a look a, a bit closer at each of those. I told you we were going to go deep uh, and, and this is pretty deep when you're thinking about uh, a presentation on Paris alignment. Here's a review of the sectorial decarbonisation approach. It's applied to companies with high emitting homogenous business activities. And a key principle is that companies in each industry must converge towards emissions intensities consistent with a two degree outcome from a unique starting point. This applies to companies which are in the cement industry, as an example, in the aviation industry, in the power generation industry. It's at the product level. So tons of carbon emissions per gigawatt hours. The way to assess all other companies, those companies that are in low uh, emitting and heterogeneous business activities where it's more challenging to understand the different contributions of their products is GEVA, the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of value add approach. And it's applied to those non-industry specific uh, companies. It applies an economy wide two degree scenario, a, a trajectory to achieve the global outcome of a reduction in carbon emissions. And this can be applied to all those companies outside of the select companies for SDA. Let's move across to the other component of climate risk assessment, which is the physical risks. As we know, a large number of the physical risks that we're referring to are already baked in to our current global warming scenario where we have a one, one degree rise in global temperatures. And, and I suppose two things to, that I think about when I'm considering that is that it's not one degree everywhere in the world. It's that, that's one degree average. So in some places, those temperatures are rising much higher than one degree on any particular day. Already we know that their companies have a large proportion of their assets exposed to, to those uh, high risk physical climate change impacts. Here we show 60% of companies in the S&P 500 and more than 40% of companies in the S&P Global 1200. When we're assessing the physical risk analysis, uh, we're looking as much as possible at the asset level. Already we have in our standard assessment uh, collected 2.7 million assets for which 
uh, that are linked back to over 110,000 companies. What's also important is the hazards that are being reviewed and the scenarios that are being applied. We're looking at seven different hazards in this table. Down the first column you can see, we're assessing sea level rise, flood, water stress, heat wave, cold wave, hurricane, and wildfire. We're focused on analyzing a metric, whether that's inundation depth or heat wave days or burnt area. We understand that the concepts of where those hazards are affecting every part of the globe. We've taken a, a scientific assessment that looks at the world and we map out where the exposure is at any location in the world to one of these stress levels. And the spatial resolution is reflective of the hazard. So for instance, where we're assessing wildfire, which by nature is an extreme and wide event, we're assessing it at 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, but where we're assessing a, a hazard that can be very located differently from a short distance, our measures are within a spatial resolution of meters rather than kilometers. To understand the sensitivity of those assets to those physical risks, we review the type of asset, where it's located in the world on that geographical map, because each asset might have a different sensitivity to a hazard. For instance, the sensitivity of an, an agricultural project is going to be much higher to water sensitivity than a residential building or a, real, a, a commercial real estate building would be to water stress. And we reflect that in our assessment. A very focused assessment on the sensitivity, whether that's water dependency, capital intensity, labor intensity, or energy intensity. We can assess these assets at their locations. We can then aggregate those up to a company level, and we can aggregate that company level up to a portfolio level. This is an example of the portfolio report. Uh, in the next section, uh, Sanya is going to show us what that looks like on the platform. We have some examples of what this looks like and, and how you can see the portfolio uh, assessment in this report. I, I won't go through this in time, but I know that this report is available to you after the presentation. Um, so please do have a look at the presentation to see some of the portfolio examples in more detail that you can see here in the following slides. But rather than show you those portfolio examples in slides, we thought it was much more uh, integrated uh, to have Sanya present this to you on our application. So Sanya, I'm going to stop sharing my deck and hand over to you. Thank you, Michael. All right, so let's start by sharing my screen. Second. Right. Michael, can I check if you can see my screen? We can see your screen. Awesome. So, Right, so let's actually start by looking at a practical application of everything that Michael has just talked about, right? And how we do that is by taking the KLSE index and we are trying to do a, a carbon footprint analysis of the KLSE index as well as a physical risk analysis. And we're trying to compare that with a global index like MSCI World, right? So we'll start by looking at the carbon footprint. Now, over here on my screen, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but the number in the first row over here is the apportioned carbon, as well as other portfolio level metrics of the KLSE index. And the second row is about the MSCI world. Now, when we look at the carbon footprint at a portfolio level, there are three primary metrics, or in fact, even four primary metrics that we generally look at. What is the total apportioned carbon or the total carbon that this portfolio is going to be responsible for? which is called as their apportioned carbon emissions. 
we look at the carbon to revenue intensity. Now, what that means is how much carbon are the portfolio companies generating on an average to produce a million dollar of revenue, right? So this is a measure of carbon efficiency of a particular portfolio. And likewise, we have a third metric called as the weighted average carbon intensity, which is very much similar in the sense that it's trying to understand the emissions for a million dollar of revenue. But now this is also going to take the weight of the stock and the sectors also into account, right? So there are these three primary metrics and the red line here at the bottom indicates the relative efficiency of the portfolio against the benchmark, right? So the portfolio being assessed is the KLSE index as of June 2021, and we're comparing it against the MSCI world. As per this analysis, it seems like the index is 150% more in terms of carbon uh, in terms of carbon emissions when it comes to carbon to revenue intensity again the index is much higher than the msci world index by around 111 percent and even when it comes to weighted average carbon intensity the portfolio is 204 percent more uh, it's more intense than the msci world index right so now that we understand that this portfolio is going to be, it has a slightly higher emission as compared to the benchmark, what is driving these emissions? Is it scope one, which is the emissions that are emitted by the resources that are directly owned by a company? Is it scope two, which is the emissions uh, emitted by a company by using purchased resources like water, steam, electricity, or is it scope three, right? So this bar over here represents the portfolio and the yellow is the scope one. So we can see that at least 60% of the portfolio's emissions are being driven by scope one, which means it's being driven by the resources that a company can directly control. As compared to the benchmark where a lot of the emissions, at least 50% of the emissions are being driven by scope three. Right, so now we want to look at the sectors, right? We want to look at what sector is going to be the highest emitter and how does the selection and the weight of a particular sector in my portfolio make a difference, right? So we are now looking here in the first two columns. We are comparing the portfolio's carbon to revenue numbers against that of the benchmark, right? Now, three things actually stands out for me. When I look at the carbon to revenue number for utilities, this tells me that on an average for utility companies, in order to generate a million dollar revenue, the portfolio is producing 3,101 metric tons as opposed to the benchmark, which is only 1,900. Likewise for materials as well, more or less double. Starkly, you can see consumer staples where the benchmark produces only 351 metric tons of emissions for generating a million dollar, while the KLSE index produces around 1,394. What is very pleasantly surprising is when you look at energy. Energy is one of the highest emitting sector, generally speaking as well. Now, when you look at the carbon to revenue of the KLSC index, it's only 148 as compared to the 722 for the MSCI world. Right? So when it comes to the most emitting or the highest polluting sector in general, the KLSC index is, is doing okay. It's doing good. Right? So in order to understand, okay, fine, for utilities, I have a much higher emission. Now, in order to understand what's driving that, we can do some sort of like an attribution analysis, which is very much similar to the Brinson attribution that we do to understand the portfolio's active returns, where we try to understand what percentage of this number is being driven by the fact that I have over allocated to a high emitting sector, which is what is measured by your sector allocation and company selection is used to explain what percentage of the active emissions are being driven by the fact that in a particular sector, I seem to have invested in high emitting companies, right? So when I look at utilities, I can see that for utilities, the portfolio has overweighted a high emitting sector 
which is why you're seeing an, a big negative red number as well as in the utility sector we seem to have selected a, a high emitting company as well which is reflected in a big negative company selection number over here but if you look at something like the financials where you have both of these positive numbers in black indicating that now financials on an average is a very low emitting sector so a, a nice positive number here in the sector allocation indicates that i have overrated a low emitting sector and even in that sector i seem to have selected low emitting companies same you'll see the same for energy as well right so this can help us better understand the sector distribution of these emissions and you'll pretty much get the same analysis even when you're trying to break down the weighted average carbon intensity across different sectors so you can see that the yellow bar which represents the weighted average carbon intensity of the portfolio as compared to the black bar which represents that of the msci world so when it comes to utilities consumer staples even healthcare and materials you will see that for these sectors the portfolio's weighted average carbon intensity is much higher than that of the msci world right so more or less similar consistent analysis that we are getting across sectors even when you're looking at two different metrics now before we actually take a look at what companies in these sectors are driving there is one important graph which i feel is extremely relevant for large investors especially the institutional investors like yourself and that is the disclosure chart now this talks about the transparency as well as the levels of disclosure that your portfolio companies are doing so over here i can see that almost so the black bar represents full disclosure so and the yellow as well as the blue bar represents either modeled or partial disclosure so what percentage of the numbers reported by the companies are actually full uh, uh, what percentage of the companies in the portfolios are actually fully disclosing their numbers versus not only 10% of the sclsc index is actually made of full disclosure numbers or made up of companies that are doing full disclosure right so a lot of strategic investors they prefer to work with the corporates in helping to improve the transparency and disclosure practices now that said we finally look at the companies that's actually driving the carbon emissions of the portfolio right so if i were to sort the companies and see which company has the highest apportioned carbon no surprises it's being driven by tanaga but it also has a very high weight in the portfolio almost 8% of the portfolio is invested in a single company in the utility sector which contributes around 41% of the portfolio's total carbon footprint followed by petronas as well as simdarvi right so this helps us understand what our current portfolio's carbon emission and the carbon footprint looks like next we want to quickly look at the physical risk associated with with this particular sorry one second now next we want to look at the physical risk analysis of this portfolio now as michael mentioned we are trying to understand how susceptible a portfolio is to different to different physical hazards and we overall we we measure it using an overall score which ranges from 1 to 100 and the closer you are to 100 means more susceptible you are to the physical risk now if you look at the the score for the klsc index it's 27 that of msci world is 24 relatively very low numbers which means it's a good sign and i can tell that almost 35% of the portfolio is spread across companies that have a physical risk score in the range of 0 to 10 and only a small percentage like only 14% of the portfolio is spread across companies that have a physical risk ranging from 61 to 70 and around 2% around 5% is spread across uh, companies that have a physical risk ranging from 71 to 80 which means almost 20% of my portfolio is invested in companies that have a physical risk score greater than 60 what is the physical risk hazard that my portfolio is most susceptible to so for both the msci world as well as the klsc index water stress or water scarcity seems to be the driving physical hazard okay now which sector is most susceptible to the physical risk 
right? So we saw that when it comes to the carbon footprint, utilities was a sector that was driving the emissions. But when it comes to physical risk, the consumer discretionary sector has a slightly high risk, where the score is around 56, followed by consumer staples, which has a score of 51. Right, very quickly, and I'll skip through this, and we look at some company level information. So what company in my portfolio has the highest, has the highest physical risk? Right, so Genting Birhad, followed by IOI Corporation, followed by Simdar, the other top three companies which has the highest physical risk. And we also saw that the physical risk that the portfolio is most susceptible to is water stress. So which company is most susceptible to water stress? So you have Simdarbi as well as Hong Leong Financial Group. Right, so this is the sort of assessment that helps us understand what my portfolio looks like and what are the physical risks that my portfolio is as of today susceptible to. So hopefully this kind of like gave you a good understanding of how we can apply scenario analysis as well as carbon footprinting to any portfolio to get a better understanding of the environmental risks associated with our portfolio. So that's pretty much it. I, I want to call upon uh, the organizer to kind of like, uh, you know, maybe move us to the next section of the presentation, please. I believe that is you. Leah, can I invite you to take the floor? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all participants uh, and welcome to our panel discussion for today's webinar. Before that, thank you, Dr. Sri. Uh, we already have with us uh, Nohi Sharm and also Aslan. Uh, before that, on behalf of uh, ISC and also CGM, which is a collaboration effort, I would like to welcome our panelists to this panel discussion to share their views and invaluable insight with us today. Uh, welcome to Michael Sabatico and also Sanya Jose. It was a very, I mean, excellent presentations from both of you. I'm very sure all our participants have learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, and also we have, as I mentioned earlier, two uh, largest institutional investors in Malaysia, EPF represented by uh, Nohi Shah Hussein, Chief Strategy Officer, and Aslan Hussein, Director Head of QT of Quark. Uh, of course, both uh, Hisham and Aslan will share with us on what they've been doing at their respective organization as far as climate-related uh, agenda is concerned. Uh, as mentioned by Pon Rohaya earlier uh, in her welcome address, she mentioned that we are now living in critical and challenging times facing the never-ending COVID-19 pandemic, uh, labor rights, political instability, right to the economic downturn. Uh, we shows that now the role of institutional investors is very crucial and they should focus seriously on sustainable development agenda. And one area that all of us believe that cannot be overlooked is the climate change and risks associated to with the issues of climate change. Uh, with a, uh, as a topic suggested today, climate change is now the main focus globally with institutional investors expected to play more proactive role in pursuing the agenda, not only at the company level, but also at managing their portfolios. Uh, more often than not, institutional investors have been accused as not responding fast enough, not doing enough, and in not prioritizing uh, enough on climate risks uh, in their investments. Agreed, it's a long journey. Barbara said governance, sustainability is a long journey. But we also have to agree that we must have a target target to be fully compliant ESG portfolio, climate neutral portfolio with zero greenhouse gas emission. These are the targets that we should have. Therefore, there must be serious efforts and action plays put in place to achieve these targets. You know, but how far we are now and how serious and how focused we are now. With that, I would like to address my first question to both Hisham and Aslan. Yeah? Uh, investors are inevitably exposed to climate risk through the portfolio they manage and invest in. 
Therefore, high quality information on company exposures to climate risks are vital for investors to make informed investment decisions. Unfortunately, we have to admit climate risk disclosure is currently insufficient. Yeah. Do you agree? Uh, my question is that, do you agree that there is an urgent need for institutional investors to start pushing strongly for climate agenda and closely monitor climate risk at the company, your company, and also at your portfolio level? As we know that EPF and Coop are uh, being seen to have taken bigger steps in committing to be fully compliant ESG portfolio, climate neutral portfolio with green, uh, with zero greenhouse gas emissions. Could you share, perhaps also share with the participants, you know, uh, well, what are the framework that has been established in your organization and what are the challenges, challenges that you foresee in meeting this commitment, especially now with the changes of the uh, uh, government, uh, the leader of the government, you know, but do you see that there'll be uh, big hurdles or big challenges in terms of achieving the targets yeah, that your company have been putting in place? Yeah, Kishan first, then only we go by Aslan, yeah? Okay, uh, thank you, Leah. Uh, um, so my cool. good afternoon. Uh, Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I, I'd like to begin by saying that, you know, I, I think we're, um, as a group, the institutional investors have really taken this on in terms of uh, recognizing ESG risk uh, and also pushing for reform uh, within our portfolio companies. Um, as far as EPF is concerned, uh, we internally launched our sustainable investing policy uh, in 2021, early 2020, sorry, early 2020. Um, uh, this is internal only. We hope to finish it by the end of the year um, after consultation uh, with all the relevant stakeholders, including our investing companies. Uh, this will encompass both, um, I think, uh, uh, materiality on ESG as well as uh, sector specific policies on the one hand, uh, as well as uh, what we call uh, um, burning issues uh, that we'd like to address, um, which include uh, the governance side, climate change, uh, as well as uh, I, I think human, uh, labor rights. Now, we, this is still under development. Uh, we're still, um, I would say early days in terms of uh, defining our policies in each area. Uh, obviously, I think the, the key thing here is to actually do the stock take in terms of where everybody is in terms of disclosures, uh, as well as material material risk, um, where we will continue to develop it going forward, and I think um, uh, it will involve quite a bit of um, uh, back and forth. I think between ourselves and our investing companies, the overall goal that EPF has at the moment uh, is to have a fully ESG compliant portfolio by 2030 and to have a climate neutral one by 2050. I'm starting to think that that's not enough anymore. <laughs> you, you know, given given the the IPCC report as well as what we're seeing around the world today, um, I, I think the timetable has to be accelerated, and we, we have to do more, uh, and we have to take a, a stronger stance in terms of uh, really pushing uh, the standards of disclosure that we need, um, as well as really looking at. Uh, risk mitigation measures because disclosure is just the first step. Um, knowing where we are is one thing, actually doing something about it is another. Uh, and that will take uh, a few different, uh, I think, steps that need to be taken. Uh, there are a lot of barriers to getting to where we want to be. Uh, the first, of course, is that, um, you know, you look at the universe of investable assets within Malaysia, even just within Malaysia, people are at different levels. Companies are at different levels in terms of disclosure. People are at different levels in terms of awareness. Uh, and getting everybody to a minimum standard itself will be a, a journey. Um, the second thing I think is the, the fact that um, we're all kind of uh, trying to reach the, uh, the end point in different ways. So there, there is a lack of standards in terms of um, or I should say there's been adoption of a lot of different standards uh, where, you know, um, and I think the other aspect of that, of course, is that materiality is different for different sectors. 
uh, which complicates things in terms of development of standards. Um, lastly, of course, is that it, given this absence of standards, compliance costs are actually higher than they should be. And that's something that we really need to look at. Uh, fourth item would be, you know, there is a lack of a governing, governing body and the uh, overall um, policy direction uh, from the government and the regulator in terms of uh, what uh, should be done. Uh, there is a lot of uh, thinking going around in the, in the background in terms of uh, what's needed, uh, but I, I think it really does need to, we, we need to land on, on one, a common standard as well as second in terms of um, uh, how to get there. And because and the thing is, uh, my background is economic, so I, I'm just as interested in the non-listed space and, and the whole economic impact of climate change rather than just looking at it from a portfolio perspective, uh, because that matters to us as one of the biggest regional investors in Malaysia. We have 15 million members. Uh, they represent the gamut of uh, adult Malaysians. Um, uh, what happens with climate change uh, uh, matters to them, uh, not just from a financial perspective, but from a quality of life perspective. Uh, so we, we want to add that aspect of it into our assessment as well. So, you know, the, the physical risk um, aspect of things is actually of uh, equal interest to me as, you know, the financial impact of it, because it will impact people's lives. It will impact SMEs. Uh, it will impact the, the entire environment in which our, our uh, listed corporates actually operate in. Uh, so that, uh, again, I think something that, that probably needs uh, a bit more emphasis as well. So I, I think I'll, I'll stop there um, and, and leave the floor for Aslan. Yeah, that, that's Isham. Uh, uh, let's hear what Aslan is going to say about this. All right. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, thanks Isham. Um, uh, first of all, I think um, on behalf of Club, I would like to thank uh, IIC and also um, um, Corporate Government Malaysia, uh, Climate Government Malaysia for inviting us. Um, it is a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, in terms of Club, right, uh, I think uh, for an institution, uh, uh, investors to actually be serious, uh, you need a dedicated team. So, fortunately, in Club, we do have a um, RI team that's actually looking on this uh, issue of ESG and matters um, 24-7. Uh, they also supported, uh, supported by um, our big team of research. So I think that to be serious in terms of looking after these matters, I think you need a team to looking at. I think I'm talking from my experience of portfolio managers because that's what I do on a daily basis. If you leave it to the portfolio manager, I think the, the ESG consideration or climate related consideration will always be sort of, I think, um, um, secondary. I think they're looking more on in terms of investment returns. So I think fortunate, I think in part we do have our our team looking at uh, those issues in terms of uh, uh, ESG as well as climate uh, change. Um, for Coop in NASA, the journey of the ESG is actually. Um, started uh, about i think a little more than 10 years ago in 2009 i think that's where i think we uh, commence our uh, stewardship as well i think share all this activism uh, and further to that in 2011 that's uh, i think we uh, um, um, have a framework on our esg for starting with equity and what gets going on after that, especially to, to, to uh, um, um, sort of extend that to uh, other asset classes like uh, fixed income as well as private equity. I think the mark uh, or the, the, the big milestone is actually in 2018, where I think um, Co-op signed for, I think, UNPRI. I think we are the first uh, pension fund in Malaysia to actually do that. So I think, um, I think a lot of things has happened after 2018. Um, for example, I think uh, um, in 2019 and, and so I think early part of this year, I think what we're looking at is actually an enhancement in terms of um, our equity um, ESG guideline. And uh, we also aiming, I think, uh, in terms of getting that um, um, climate uh, related uh, uh, risk into um, integrating into our uh, investment decision making. I think we target to do that by year end. I think this is actually being done by our uh, dedicated team. So I think that's that's um, um, uh, something that you know um, um, I think Quark feels that's very close to heart, uh, our heart in terms of ESG. In fact, um, um, we did some I think um, uh, carbon footprint uh, for our domestic equity portfolio. That's actually in 2018, um, but it's 
very, I think, tedious and painstaking um, 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 uh, exercise simply because I think what we do not have what I think SMP has actually, I think, uh, um, uh, presented to us today. I think, uh, I think simply because I think the, the challenge at that point of time is I think in terms of uh, availability of data. I think that's, that's I think, um, mentioned by, by Isham as well. The other challenges that we think that um, um, uh, in terms of uh, we face as institutional investors is actually in terms of uh, the, the, the I think the spread of our investment, I think, is keep uh, increasing. I think uh, we started the equity fixed income and, and the private equity and, and, and property. Now we also have, I think, property development. So I think each of these asset classes, I think, uh, require different, I think, uh, uh, measurement as well for, for that. I think the last part of challenges, I would think um, that would be in terms of, uh, I think, um, to get um, um, the investor companies uh, to be aware and uh, and have that uh, full disclosure. I think at the moment, what we find out is actually, I think uh, we are engaging our investor companies and asking them for a voluntary disclosure. I think we've seen that in, in some of the, um, our investor com uh, companies uh, in energy sectors, as well as I think utilities. So um, there are progress on that. I think uh, if your question, let's say that, that uh, whether we can do more, yes, I think I would agree that we can actually do more. And and I certainly agree uh, with Isham as well in terms of I think, uh, uh, getting that, I think, milestone to be achieved earlier rather than waiting uh, 2050 or 2013. Thank you, Leah. Okay, thanks, Aslam. My, my next question, uh, because you mentioned the certain challenges for, for, for your organization to meet the commitment or the target, but you know that there's been strong approach by the regulators as well as the certain extent uh, our institutional investors, you know, on the board involvement or the board uh, oversight role as far as sustainability or uh, especially climate related uh, uh, matters concerned. And one of the issues that all always a concern whether our our board members or our directors are well equipped with knowledge with experience to actually uh, challenge management right so i want to know from your organization your own board at blitz level do you face this problem you know where your board uh, actually can't be bothered, you know, or leave it to the management. I mean, in the first place, whether they have that uh, uh, skill or experience to actually challenge and drive the, the direction for management to achieve whatever you intend to achieve in terms of this uh, uh, agenda. Yeah. Isham, <laughs> I'm not sure whether. <laughs> uh, I mean, what do, you oh, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, what do you think? You know? Because yeah, he has to watch the talk, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm just a little worried. I might have some, uh, some of my board members here. Um, uh, I, I, I think one of the approaches we've taken is to actually um, help educate our board uh, about what the issues actually are. Um, one thing here is that um, I think the same co-op faces the same issue is that our, our board is is actually defined within the act itself. So the, it has uh, certain representatives from certain uh, stakeholder groups, right? Um, having said that, I think what we've tried to do is actually engage at the board committee level to make sure that they are equipped with necessary knowledge um, uh, to um, uh, at least understand some of the issues as well as uh, I think um, uh, really help us drive uh, sustainability going forward. Uh, I know our investment panel is um, very well aware of uh, what the, the issues actually are as well as, um, and they've been very encouraging, I think, in terms of our adoption of ESG standards, uh, as well as looking at the risk from climate uh, change. Having said that, I think, um, uh, you know, each individual, you know, you only have a limited amount of um, bandwidth and um, um, it, does fall back on management to actually do a much more comprehensive, uh, I think, risk assessment and present that to for decision making. Uh, in terms of um, especially our engagement with um, our investing companies, also uh, we'd like to see the same thing, um, where uh, boards are also equipped with the knowledge um, uh, around the issues around sustainability uh, and. 
really drive their management towards um, you know, uh, really addressing uh, some of these issues. Thanks, Shahaba uh, uh, Aslan. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to put you into trouble. I'm sorry, yeah, you're, you're putting me on, on, on the spot right now. Um, but I think I um, totally agree with uh, Hisham on, on that. I think um, I would say that in terms of ESG, right, I think the, S, uh, the Gs, I think um, uh, there's a lot of inf information on that. And I think E and S is actually um, where I think the, the, the lack of information, I think. So I think for us to actually make that informed decision, I think um, the, uh, we need to educate uh, our board members as well. So I think that, that is, will be part of our uh, team at our RI. I think we've done a lot of, I think, uh, um, awareness and, and, and uh, events to actually, you know, educate. Uh, so I think that that's will be uh, an ongoing uh, sort of, uh, I think, continuous exercise to, to educate our board. I think just to touch on the investing companies as well, I think that's that's why I think uh, for Quap, I think what we wanted to do actually, we prefer engagement rather than divestment. So I think, um, uh, I think personally, what I would prefer is actually, you know, um, not to actually, you know, have a mandatory uh, in terms of uh, requirement for disclosure, but uh, I think more voluntary sort of, I think, um, um, a carrot rather than a uh, dangle a carrot rather than uh, a sticker. So I think for, for I think board members, I think um, I, I, if I can touch on uh, the new code, I think issued by corporate governance, uh, Malaysian corporate governance uh, um, board, I think, uh, quote on that is actually I think um, the extension of the responsibility of the board uh, for for I think companies and institutions is actually you know, extended to in terms of I think uh, shaping the direction of the company in terms of making sure that there is sustainability um, um, issues actually look at uh, so I think that's that's uh, something that you know uh, we can actually um, uh, um, uh, follow up uh, in terms of uh, how we make our board members is actually aware on that thanks uh, in fact, I have a comment, but I will put it later in my next question because you mentioned that you prefer to it to be voluntary rather than mandatory disclosure. I have, I have something that I want to ask related to that. But before we go further, uh, my, my, my question to Michael and Sanya. You heard from our two panelists, you know, uh, these are two biggest uh, institutional investors in Malaysia. They have said that they have done a lot and they have focused in terms of reaching their, their target. And even Disha mentioned that he felt that the efforts on climate related matters should be accelerated rather than 2030, 2050, right? Efforts should be there. But we also have uh, institutional investors in Malaysia which are uh, just taking baby steps, right? So they will find it difficult to, to match uh, what EPF uh, and, and what, you know, have done so far. Uh, what, what do you think should be the focus area or the focus for these smaller institutional investors we, uh, which are now just taking baby steps so that the end of the day, they can still reach their destination for global warming to 1.5 degree and also zero uh, greenhouse gas emission by 2050 as per the Paris Agreement. Uh, thank you, thank you, Leah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start my um, my answer with the conclusion, uh, so and then end with the conclusion. And the answer really is TCFD aligned reporting. We're in a rapidly changing state of finance. The uh, concepts around climate change have come together very quickly under the banner of TCFD. Climate change has been on the con a concern for humanity for the last 30 years. But in reality, this has very quickly changed. We are in, at an historic point in the history of finance, in the history of education, uh, in the history of, of, of economic and, and the way economics are being handled. I, I like the fact that, that, um, you know, that uh, Nurisham said that he's an economist. I also have a passion for economics. Um, you, you, you both talked about education. It's really important because of the rapid change. Education is critical because climate change is a risk, just like any risk. We're investors. We're finance people. We understand. We deal with risks all the time. We understand the level of risk that we accept. Climate change is an area of ESG and sustainability where we can make clear measurements. And this, this is one of the reasons that it's it's easier to talk about because it can be, you can take science, convert it into numbers, put those into reports in front of your boards, in front of the boards of the companies that you invest in. Uh, there has been a focus globally across 
the materiality of climate change and the materiality of climate change is captured in much of the existing reporting and duties of companies in the regulation in stock exchange reporting the focus on materiality is is a, as a requirement to to be reported or to be informed is added to the guidelines of these regulators and exchanges and because again climate change can be measured and the risks are material um, we can uh, we can see the connection between the the requirement to report there's also the legal aspect in in many countries the legal aspect is being pointed to as a duty of care and responsibility once we accept that climate change is happening which i think most of us have then it's easy to point to the impact of climate change the materiality of that impact and therefore the duty of care of the trustees of boards and directors under existing um, under existing regulation and and finally i just want to highlight that there are benefits there's benefits in mandatory reporting companies that report on their scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, the locations of their assets, for instance, they're there, then able to control that. Uh, they own that information and they can ensure that it's accurate. Where it's not being reported, it's being estimated. It's then out of the control of the companies. And so it, the companies lose that ability to, to have ownership over what they're reporting. That estimated data gets used in the same uh, carbon footprint and is used in the trans, trans in the scenario analysis the transition scenario analysis the carbon price and Paris alignment it's a critical component it needs to be done correctly because it's the foundation of those assessments and their scenario assessments forecast so if the, if the foundation is wobbly then there's more error in the forecasts uh, in, in, in concluding there, we talked about S factors. Uh, many of the S factors are driven by climate action or climate related environmental factors. There's a connection there, it's a really strong connection. And so that all points to TCFD. And TCFD captures some of the areas that you asked about too. Certainly Aslan talked about, um, or you asked the question about reporting. TCFD provides a framework and a structure too. Governance, strategy, risk management and the metrics that go with it it's useful it uh, allows for consistent reporting which is then comparable uh, i call i add to that the use of credible scenarios which uh, create a more meaningful uh, uh, estimate or a meaningful analysis sorry of your exposure that can then be used in your strategies senior any comment no, I, I think Michael pretty much covered most of it. I don't think I could have put it any better than what Michael yeah. has okay. said. Yeah, I agree with that. But you see, my next question is that related to, uh, you know, you, you, we, we all know that recently the SGX RECO issued a public consultation paper proposing for climate-related disclosures to be mandated uh, uh, based on the TCFD recommendations, independent assurance on the accuracy and completeness of data, as well as managing director's training on sustainability. Just now, Aslan mentioned that he believes it should be voluntarily instead of mandatory. But uh, I just have to say this, uh, the attitude of our public sector company, they will not do anything voluntarily unless it's mandated by regulators. And when regulators mandate it, they will say too much of regula regulations, you know. So they are just confused mind, you know. So in order to make them do it, you know, like, like you can see, Bangladesh is different. Even they say voluntarily, all financial institutions make sure they do it. So that's the difference between uh, financial institutions and other listed entities, you see. My question is, is that you know you mentioned that uh, you you look at our regulators. Do you think that our regulators, our regulators facilitating the journey uh, uh, enough? Uh, in what they have done enough to facilitate the journey in climate reporting, especially under current circumstances where there are so many conflicting uh, priorities. You know, they, uh, you can see the difference between the SGX and our Bursa. Bursa, I mean, as yet now with the new consultation paper, they're very focused on what they want to do. By us, our Bursa is still trying to advocate, trying to promote. And mind you, I think it's not effective. 
that, I mean, as far as listed companies are concerned, forget about those financial institutions like I mentioned, even though voluntary, but yeah. they make it, they do it because they know Bank Negara mandated quietly. It's the spirit, it has, it's mandated, even though voluntary. What are your comments in this? Yeah. Um, what I can talk to is, is my direct experience and, and there is uh, climate action in, in the parts of, the, of Asia Pacific where I've been directly involved. Um, so you mentioned Singapore, but also in Australia, there was the Australian Sustainable Financial Initiative. Uh, there's been uh, reports and, and papers uh, written by the Council of Financial Regulators highlighting the materiality of climate change. I was part of the investor group on climate change, CDP, uh, an AXI paper called Confusion to Clarity, which called out the benefits. I was also um, part of the Hong Kong Sustainable Financial uh, SFC group assessment uh, working group looking at um, reporting where, where they're uh, pointing towards mandatory reporting and, um, and involved in working groups in the Singapore Green Finance Initiative. So these initiatives have all sprung up uh, very quickly uh, over recent years as these economies look to quickly uh, in, in quickly ensure a resilient future uh, and and so we're seeing more and more of these economy uh, these economies these countries uh, adopt these practices uh, and uh, I know that you know 70% of the global economy has a net zero target so we haven't even really talked about net zero but that's happening and that's going to affect every country including Malaysia and the trading partners of Malaysia so these are all effects on Malaysia well, I can't talk directly about um, the exact regulation and policies in Malaysia. Uh, it, it's an example of what's happening very close around Malaysia and the activity and the higher levels of activity, uh, which, which I, I think it, it's, it's a, uh, something that's uh, capturing the attention of all countries. Uh, and I, I'd be surprised if Malaysia and the regulators were able to ignore that. Yeah. Uh, but, but Hisham and uh, uh, Aslan, do you think our regulators are actually moving fast in promoting the climate-related agenda? Um, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, Hisham, I'll answer. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I think I cannot speak for, for the regulator, but I think but, but, but I've seen so far in the sense that I, I think our regulators, be it BUSA or SC, I think they've done a lot of I think, awareness campaign and events on ESG. And in fact, I think if I rem remember correctly, I think SC has actually um, uh, launched a, a roadmap to uh, SRI in 2019. And, uh, and then that's, that's one. I think recently as well, I think SC also has done I think, in terms of, I think they, what they're looking at is actually to release a paper, public consulting paper, on SRI taxonomy. I think that's it's actually a targeting uh, to, to uh, by end of uh, 2021. I think that's to, will actually provide in terms of clarity, in terms of uh, uh, the, the classification of uh, SRI or, or uh, investment uh, uh, activities for, for this company. And number two, I think I've, I've noticed as well, I think in terms of Bank Nagara, I think they established this uh, Joint Committee for Climate Change. I think in short, it's like the JC3. Uh, and they also, I think, issued uh, in, in April uh, um, uh, this year in terms of a code, I think it's called, um, if I can remember correctly, it's CCPT, as it stands for uh, Climate Change for Principle Based Taxonomy. I think those are, I think, clearly, I think, for their members, which is mostly financial institution, uh, to actually uh, um, report in terms of the financial um, exposure to climate uh, risk related. I think that's, that's, I think, being done. So they also are talking that, you know, that will be mandatory. But I think, as you mentioned correctly, Leah, I think for, for financial institution, when Ben Nagara said voluntarily, uh, they always, I think, uh, uh, um, uh, agree to that uh, without having to actually put it as mandatory. But I think, again, I think that's, that's it's actually um, down to attitude, uh, right? The attitude of the company as well as uh, individual. I think, I think to me, I think um, um, uh, ESG matters is, is not only the sole responsibility of the regulator, um, asset owners, institution, corporates and company. It's also individual like us, like consumer. And I was reading the other day in the sense that, that uh, you know, Oxfam in, in UK, I think uh, they estimated that around 13 million of item of clothing is actually sent to landfill on a weekly basis. I think that's true in terms of the consumer behaviors. I think it has to start from us as well, I think in terms of changing that behavior. 
So I think um, I end uh, uh, on that note. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Isha, any comment? <laughs> uh, what well, do you want to see from the regulators? Yeah. Okay, I, I, I can understand their dilemma because they're in a bit of between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, you know, we know this is the right thing to do, uh, that we need to have uh, much more disclosure and standardized disclosures on, on climate-related risk and for that matter on social and governance issues as well. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know what BUSA has been like for the last 10 years. It, it hasn't been exactly very exciting. Right, uh, the pipeline is bare. Uh, so you know, you impose all these closure requirements, and you basically raise the cost of compliance for any company that wants to go for this thing. Uh, so you know, you, they they do have to, you know, really walk that fine line of balance between um, really um, imposing uh, a high standard of uh, governance uh, on ESG issues, and on the other hand. Um, getting companies to actually get into the capital markets. Because we know there's a lot of big companies in Malaysia out there that aren't listed, uh, that don't resort to um, um, uh, equity financing. So, you, you know, that it is trying to really um, balance out those two competing imperatives, I think, um, which is why we've, we've gotten um, uh, really down this route of voluntary disclosures rather than mandatory ones. Okay. Uh, we, before I have another question, but before that, we also received a question from Angela from BNP Paribas. I mean, any one of you can answer. Should we compare Malaysia to MICI world? Should we look at comparison to EM? Anyone to answer that question? I think if we want to get to the point where we were getting real disclosures and uh, you know uh, real action taken, then I. We benchmark against the best or the highest. And I totally concur with Hisham. The thing is that we could choose to ben benchmark ourselves either with regional leaders or even you know local leaders, or we could aspire to a higher standard. And obviously, an aspiration to a higher standard is always desired, but it's a long journey. And it's not an overnight journey. So it always starts by first understanding where we would stand regionally and then aim to kind of like become global leaders. So I, I do understand where that question came from, and there is total validity in that question. But I feel that when we compare ourselves with global leaders, we set the destination. Right? So we know that that's where we aim to reach. And then, you know, that helps us kind of like derive the journey as well. So that means we should actually benchmark to higher standards, right? Sure. Okay. Uh, the, the next question here mentioned about if you use a broader FBM 100 index instead of KLSC, which only consists of 30 companies, would we expect WACI to be higher? Anyone? This from um, yes, yeah. So because carbon intensity and weighted average carbon intensity is going to be driven by the weight of the stocks in the company, in the portfolio, as well as the carbon intensity of the underlying constituents, now, it could go either ways. You can't really tell that if we increase the number of companies from 30 to, let's say, 100, that it's going to kind of like decrease the carbon intensity because what if you're now adding more carbon intensive companies into your portfolio? But on the flip side, because the individual weight of a single stock in your portfolio goes down, its overall contribution to the portfolio is wacky goes down as well. Right? So we don't really have a clear answer at this point whether it will always go down or it will go up. Could go in either direction depending on the kind of companies being added to the portfolio. Okay. My, my next question is more for Hisham and, and, and Aslan. You know, globally, investors have shown uh, uh, have been showing strong conviction on the boards of a side role. Remember, I mentioned just now in the sensibility agenda, uh, as steward of the organization, the board actually expected to play a crucial role in overseeing this transition and journey closely and have the ability to challenge management. Uh, if you, in May this year, we saw a hedge fund activist, engine number one, successfully removed two board members of Exxon Mobil Corp as they felt that the board has failed to adjust its business strategy to match global efforts to combat climate change. As institutional uh, investors in Malaysia, do you foresee moving forward, we will play more effective stewardship role and shareholder activism in Malaysia? 
in promoting sustainability agenda, especially relating to climate change. To the extent you uh, institutional investors will also vote against directors for failing to discharge their fiduciary duty in this aspect. Hisham and, and Aslan. I think at the moment we always say we want to engage, we, we, we promote, we persuade them. But do you think that now is the time for you to say no more, you don't do it, we will vote against you. You look at BlackRock, they vote against the director of this tech company when they felt that the independent directors failed to discharge their duty to, pro, to protect the, the interests of the or the welfare of the workers. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, at the risk of being premature, we are um, right now formulating an action plan in terms of what actions are we going to take if we're not seeing the kind of progress that we want to see. Uh, to a certain extent, I think KWSP or EPF um, uh, will be patient. I think in terms of what our disclosure requirements, it's not that uh, demanding, uh, but we do want to see progress. and. Um, there will be actions even if that progress is not seen. Um, what those actions are uh, would be, I think, um, situation dependent. Uh, it would depend a great deal on the specifics of the company, but we would like to see, I think, um, um, uh, at least one of the directors who are, you know, trained in sustainability. We would like to see uh, uh, definitive plans from our investing companies uh, that they are heading in the right direction. Uh, in the absence of those plans, I, I think um, that's when, um, well, from our perspective, we need to do some risk mitigation measures. Aslan? Yeah, uh, I think um, it has, I think for Coop, it has always been a policy in terms of engagement. I think um, if I remember correctly, I think we've done a lot of engagement this year, I think especially on the global sectors. Um, I think uh, we actually, I think, um, not just meeting meeting the company, but I think we also go up to the minister, uh, Ministry of uh, International Trade uh, to actually meet them and, and advise. I think um, that has been the approach. I think it will continue. Um, for us, um, what we wanted to do is actually um, 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 guide and advise our investor company. Uh, I think that's that's the, the number one, I think, uh, approach that we continue. I think um, um, we do handle corporate governance issue in a slightly different way, uh, in the sense that if there are serious issue of governance, then um, the, the action will actually uh, be discussed within, I think, our, our, our governance structure in Coop and we'll take action on that. But I think on, on, on the board, I think uh, um, I, uh, we actually publish a document to, uh, uh, in terms of our post voting guidelines and it's actually available publicly and we actually uh, send it uh, to all our investor committee to make sure that they are aware in terms of how we actually, uh, our expectation of part to, the, to the, our investor companies and what our expectation to, to their board members as well. And that's very much I think, clear in terms of uh, uh, what we expect of them. So, so uh, if uh, they are not meeting expectation, I think um, the team over uh, in in in, in Kuala will actually recommend uh, the, the 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 right or necessary action. Thank you. We cannot hear you. I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Uh, you know, uh, I have one question from the participant, you know, uh, from Zai, I think it's Dato, Dato Zaitun, I think. To what extent has SMP factored climate risk into corporate credit ratings issued? I think this for the SMP to answer. Thanks, Leah. Uh, so the, the ratings uh, team at SP Global have been assessing. Uh, ESG risks for some time now and in fact they're, they're able to identify the ES and G events that lead to uh, actions and uh, produce a, an assessment of the number of ES and G events over a, a period of time that have, have led to uh, ratings actions and it, it's in the vicinity of, of hundreds of of examples so um you know something i'd be happy to to share with with the group 
Uh, and they're extending that even further now so that there will be uh, tools that can be used, uh, ESG scorecards that can be used to assess companies um, that even don't have a rating. So we've got you know 9,000 plus companies which have uh, a rating, which is an in-depth intensive process of engaging companies and speaking to management, interviews with management. And then we have processes which allow us to assess the, the credit uh, of companies using um, uh, quantitative assessments of the, the ratings uh, data and trends. And so we'll be creating uh, these scorecards, which uh, also allow you to assess the ESG events. And in, in fact, to, to answer the user's question directly, um, an interesting uh, progression enhancement to our ratings process is to be more transparent around the ESG uh, contributors. There will be an ESG credit indicator uh, available uh, before the end of this year, which highlights those ESG events. The E events, of course, um, tending to be more aligned with the climate events to be more directly to the question so our, our clients will be able to see uh, more transparently yeah. uh, if, we, if, if i have more questions but unfortunately i think we're running out of time I, i'm reminded to stop this session you know very interesting sharing of uh, uh, information if i have a few more questions but unfortunately we don't have the time i think with this I, i need to conclude the session and on behalf of isc and cgm i would like to express my appreciation and thanks to our panelists the four panelists and also of course to all our participants you know for spending their valuable time to be with us from the start until the end you know uh, but one quote that i would like to say let's join hand together to make our planet safe and conducive not only for today but our future generations i think all of us have to do our part yeah okay with that thank you so much take care and stay safe everyone yeah